Tonight I want to speak to you on the subject of questions about the rapture. And many times in our Lost Lamb events, people that give their hearts to Christ, and by the way, if you're here tonight and you've never personally and publicly repented of sin and given your heart to Jesus Christ, when I'm done tonight, I'm going to give you that opportunity. If you listen to me preach and teach on Bible prophecy, you'll hear me say all the time, Bible prophecy was not given to scare us, Bible prophecy was given to prepare us. And if there's only one verse in the Bible you learn concerning Bible prophecy and eschatology, my recommendation would be that you memorize Matthew chapter 24 and verse 44. And there the Bible says, Be ye also ready, for in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. Be ye also ready, for in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. The greatest thing that can evolve out of your knowledge of the Bible and Bible prophecy and end time events is the sure knowledge that you're saved and that you're ready to go. There will be people when the rapture takes place who are saved and secure in Christ who knew little to nothing about eschatology and Bible prophecy. But they were saved and they were right with God and being in Christ, they will be taken. However, there will be some people who are very religious, very studied, may even have degrees, may even be graduates from seminaries, and could discuss Bible theology and eschatology and end time events for hours upon hours and dazzle you with everything they know from the great prophecies of the Bible. But they knew it in their head, but were not right with Christ in their heart. And they'll be left behind. And so I want to encourage you in the very infancy of our time together, when I give the invitation at the end of this time, you need to, number one, get right with God. You can begin to learn the Bible and figure it out as you grow in your faith. I've met thousands of people in 56 countries of the world in my 40 plus years of preaching who oftentimes say something like this. Well, there's just some things I've got to study and figure out before I make my commitment to Christ. Where's the logic in that? Where's the intelligence in that? Where is the common sense in that? Where does it say that you have to figure it all out before you can get right with God? Get right with God while you still don't know Genesis from Revelation. You can figure it out as you're growing in your faith. Step number one, don't miss this. Step number one in your spiritual life is turn from sin and turn to Christ and then begin to grow in your faith from there. Because you cannot learn and discover the Bible from just an intellectual perspective. It is a spiritual book and it must be approached spiritually and learned by the Holy Spirit. For Paul told the Corinthians that the things of God are blind to those who are unsaved. You have no ability to fully understand, comprehend, and discern spiritual truth until you have right relationship with God because it's not a textbook. It's the holy living word of God. Amen. And because it's a spiritual book, it has to be approached from a spiritual perspective and learned by the Spirit. And here's the good news. is The Bible says the Holy Spirit will guide us into all truth. And this will help some of you because you were terrible in school. And it wasn't that you weren't intelligent. I mean, maybe some of you weren't, but many of you, you just were bored. You didn't like school. You didn't fit in. You had something against a teacher. A teacher had something against you. And there are many reasons why people don't do well in school. 
There are many reasons why people flunk out in school, and it's not always an IQ issue. Sometimes it's a cultural issue. Sometimes it's a racial issue. Sometimes it's a human incompatibility issue. Sometimes people have been so abused at home that they disconnect and they're not able to learn. There's many, many reasons why people don't do well in school. But I have good news for you. When you repent of sin and receive Jesus Christ, your IQ will increase from that day forward all the days of your life. Because the Bible says in the book of James, if anybody lacks wisdom, let them ask of God who gives to all men liberally and upbraideth not. But let them ask in faith believing, nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like the waves of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. Let not that man think he shall receive anything from the Lord. James said, if anyone lacks wisdom, and anyone in the original Greek means anyone. If anyone lacks wisdom, you can ask of God. And by the Holy Spirit, he'll begin to supernaturally, he created your brain to begin with. And he'll begin to cause your brain to function in a way both biologically and spiritually in a way that you had never had that capacity before. And you cognitively will grow all the days of your life. One of the professors at the Bible college where I'm currently the chairman his name is Dr. David Ritchie. He has the highest level of education of any of our faculty. His PhD is a European modeled faculty PhD. Brilliant man. He reads and writes fluently biblical Hebrew, which is a dead language. He reads and writes fluently biblical Greek, which is a dead language. He reads and writes fluently Aramaic. Five languages he reads and writes. When he reads the Old Testament, he picks up a Hebrew Bible and reads it out of a Hebrew Bible. When he reads the New Testament, he has a Greek Bible and reads from the original Greek. Brilliant man. But he was an Italian punk on the streets of East Providence, Rhode Island when he got saved. Did terrible in school. No doubt would have been in the mafia because that was his family history. But he wandered into Zion Gospel Temple. His cousin, Pat Manzo. Everybody that loves the Italian, say amen. If you don't, don't breathe a word. <laughs> I love my Italian brothers and sisters. Some of the most precious people on the earth are the Italians. They have kept me in pants bigger than I should be wearing for so many years of my ministry. <laughs> but I want to tell you something. His cousin got saved. And began to witness to him. And I'm telling you, he was a thug with a criminal record as a teenager. Flunked out of school. But wandered into Zion Gospel Temple. Gave his heart to Jesus Christ. And God took him from a kid off the streets with no future. To one of the most brilliant individuals I have ever met. As I'm continuing my own education at this stage of life, I asked him to be my academic mentor. He's my academic mentor. I speak to him almost every week of my life. And it's just a miracle to me. I laugh at him sometimes. And I just say, I'm sorry. I don't mean to laugh at you. But I remember you when you got saved. And it just strikes me funny. What God can do with a life that's fully surrendered to him.
I don't know who needs this encouragement as we begin to study the rapture of the church tonight, but there are people within the sound of my voice that fear the subject of prophecy and Bible prophecy and eschatology and end time events because they think you need a high IQ to begin to discover these truths. Let me tell you something. The fundamentals of Bible prophecy can be taught to your children and your grandchildren. And we're going to learn tonight about the rapture. 1 Thessalonians 4, let's go to verse 13. Those of you that are taking notes this week, this is the classic passage on the rapture of the church. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13, and I'm going to read down through verse 18. And I'm reading out of the New King James Version. In verse 13 it says, But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren... By the way, that's the fastest growing church in America. The church of the ignorant brethren. <laughs> I believe that's a Pew Research discovery. I want to pause here long enough because the word ignorant has a little bit of abrasiveness to most of us in our culture. But it is translated correctly. It is rendered from the original accurately. But it doesn't mean what most of us think it means. When Paul is writing to these brand new Christians in the church in Thessalonica and said, I don't want you to be ignorant, what he's saying is, I don't want you to be uninformed. I don't want you to be uneducated on this subject. So, if you're taking notes, I want you to understand that Paul's not being abrasive. Paul's just saying, and rendered from the original language, he's saying, I don't want you to be unlearned concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. Verse 14, for if we believe, it could be just as accurately rendered from the original text, since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep. Now, it's not talking about physical sleep. And again, it's a perfect interpretation from the original, but it's talking about death or separation from the physical body. But in their language, in that culture, uh, sleep would have been accurate. It was just kind of a euphemism in their language. But Paul is talking about people who have died. He said, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. Because when you die, if you're a believer and you're in Christ, by the way, if you're taking notes, here's a solid piece of information gold. The only requirement to be ready for the rapture is to be in Christ. Many times in the biblical writing, you'll find those two words, in Christ. And the wonderful news tonight is that is the only thing you need to be sure of to be ready for the rapture. You need to know my life is in Christ. How does one know that you are in Christ? I always say getting right with God is as simple as ABC. A, you have to admit your sin. B, you have to believe in Jesus Christ. Not just believe he existed. Not just believe he was a great prophet or teacher. Not just believe that he was a classic world revolutionary. But believe that Jesus is the son of the living God. Believe that he came to this earth and died on a cross for sinners. Believe that he rose again. That he's coming soon. Jesus Christ, you must believe. And then C, you have to make a commitment. So if you're here tonight and you're not sure you're right with God, and I always say it and I mean it, if you're the worst sinner in the zip code tonight, I'm your best friend. I mean that. I've dedicated my life to sinners. Now, Christians, I love you. And if you've known me for 40 years, you know I mean that. I love you. I'm never mean to anybody. I've always believed that when you became a Christian, you forfeit your right to be unkind to people. Even people who are unkind to you or are unkind to me. 
Now, it doesn't mean that I let people walk all over me, but I'm never mean to anybody. You really have to cross a lot of lines with me before we go to blows. Jesus is patient with people, and we should be patient with people. One of the most incredible verses that Paul ever wrote, he wrote to the church at Colossae, and in Colossians 2, he said, make allowance for one another's faults. It's amazing how people get saved and then all of a sudden they sit on their high horse and judge everybody. You better remember where you came from. You better remember where the Lord brought you from. The Bible says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Don't ever forget where you came from. You don't have to live in it. You don't have to waddle in it like a pig in mud. But don't forget where the Lord brought you from and stay focused on where you're headed. I am so glad that he brought me out from the curse of sin and brought me through the cross into the blessing of God. I, A, admitted my sin. I, B, believed in Jesus Christ. I, C, committed my heart to him. And it changed my life. And it'll change your life. And when I give the invitation tonight, we're going to pray the sinner's prayer together, and it'll do the same for you. Amen. Some of you may pray that prayer for the very first time. You've never done it personally and publicly. But biblically, that's what you've got to do. You've got to do it personally and publicly. Why do I say that? Because everybody Jesus called, he called personally and publicly. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, verse 15 that we who are alive and remain under the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. Very unique that Paul's using asleep in Christ. Why? Because once you have Jesus Christ, you never die. For God so loved the world, the most memorized verse in the Bible is John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's why Paul picked these unique words that are rendered sleep in the English because you don't die spiritually as a believer. You only die physically. But Paul said to be absent from the body is to be present with Christ. For the believer, death is a brief transaction between life temporary and life eternal. And the good news is, is when you are brought into newness of life after the physical death of your body, if you live to be 120 years old and you die on the 18th hole, walking uphill, carrying your golf clubs and dragging your buddy Charlie, you'll wake up in heaven in a brand new body. Perfectly well. No sickness, no disease, no infirmity in heaven. The rapture is going to be one of the most glorious things. You're not going to want to miss that ride. Verse 16, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. By the way, there's only one archangel in the Bible. People talk about archangels, and by the way, I, I did an entire month of study on the subject and the theology of angelology, which is the study of angels. And in that study, I also did the study of demons because demons in proper theology is a subset of angelology because demons are fallen angels. However, everybody wants to ascribe archangel to multiple angels but just as a piece of Bible knowledge for you, there's only one archangel mentioned in the Bible, and it's Michael. Gabriel is often ascribed as an archangel, but the Bible never calls him an archangel. He's oftentimes thought to be an archangel because of the incredible assignments that he was involved in, particularly the birth and the arrival of Christ. But there's only one archangel in the Bible mentioned, and it's Michael. And so when the Bible says, with the voice of an archangel... That's probably going to be Michael. And with the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. Notice the timing of this. The dead in Christ, those who were in Christ but physically died, 
they are going to have a resurrection and they're first in line. The dead in Christ will rise first. I heard about a Baptist and a Presbyterian who were arguing over who was going to go first, Baptist or Presbyterians, and the Baptist finally conceded to the Presbyterian saying, well, it must be the Presbyterians because the Bible said the dead in Christ shall rise first. <laughs> that would be improper interpretation of Scripture. That's called eisegesis. Verse 17, then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up. If you have your highlighter, highlight that because that's the rapture and I'm going to come back to that. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and thus shall we always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Highlight the word comfort. The rapture is not meant to be a traumatic subject. The rapture is not meant to be something in the Bible that we fear. It's a comforting subject. It means that when the world is going to hell in a handbasket, we have the promise of being delivered out of the mess with victory in the Lord Jesus Christ. And not only will we be taken to be with the Lord, but will rule and reign with him forever and forever. The rapture is the beginning of your bright tomorrow. So let me ask you a very sobering question. Does the thought of the rapture bring satisfying comfort to your heart or sobering concern? The reason I ask that question is if when you listen tonight as I'm preaching on the rapture of the church from the Bible, by the way, if you and I are just meeting, I'm one of those old school preachers that starts in the Bible, stays in the Bible, and finishes in the Bible. I pledge that to you at the beginning of these meetings. I'll keep that promise to you. I saturate everything I do with the Bible. You're never going to hear my personal opinion. Because God's word is always anointed. My commentary about it may or may not be. So if you start in the Bible, stay in the Bible, and finish in the Bible, you'll never go awry. So I'm asking you a question based upon those Bible passages. When you think of the rapture, does it bring a satisfying comfort to your heart? Or a sobering concern? Because if you have that sobering concern, or if you have that awkward, ill feeling, it might be your first indicator that you need to pray the sinner's prayer. Because when you have a security in Christ, the thought of the rapture is a comfort. Paul said, comfort one another with these words. So if the subject of the rapture and the last days and final events and the soon coming of Christ and apocalypse, if all of that is something that causes you to have anxiety and palpitations, it might be a good way of knowing that you need to make a commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ. Surprisingly, I read recently that more than half of Americans, 21st century survey, half of Americans believe in the rapture of the church. According to Newsweek, not long ago, 55% of Americans believe that the faithful will be taken up to heaven in the rapture. But I will tell you this, in all of my four decades plus of preaching the gospel and preaching on Bible prophecy, no single subject in Bible prophecy has more misunderstandings, more questions, and more confusion than the subject of the rapture of the church. And it's sad because it really shouldn't be. But I'm going to be honest enough to tell you that there are certain people who have various teachings on the rapture that do not answer the proper interpretation of Scripture. Now, obviously, in one message together, I can't do an exhaustive study on everybody's points of contention. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to walk you straight through the Bible and lay out the biblical substantial argument as to exactly how it's going to happen so you'll know. Question number one, what is the rapture? 
because of the hundreds of thousands of people that view and email, and that is probably the number one question. It's the title of my message. It's the title of the study. If you're live watching or online watching or watching one of our video series or listening on the podcast channel, it's the number one question that I get on the subject. What is the rapture? Or somebody just gets saved and they're walking through our Lost Lamb Discipleship beginning teachings and they say, I, I got your Bible and I'm, I'm beginning to read and study the Bible and, and thank you, but I can't find the rapture anywhere in the Bible. Did you make it up? And so it's a good question. It's a great question. What is the rapture? So let me give you, without going into a professorial uh, classroom setting, let me give you just a real basic fundamental definition for the rapture that you can give to people that may ask of you. The rapture refers to the sudden catching up of the church or believers. How many of you know that the church is not a building? The rapture is not going to be property snatched from their foundations as much as this is a beautiful facility, when the rapture takes place, the building's going to be left behind, but you as a believer are going to be taken. And by the way, the greatest crowd that will ever attend this church will be within hours of the rapture taking place. Every Bible-believing church in every community around the world that had a reputation of being a godly church with a godly pastor and Bible-believing preaching. Within moments of the rapture taking place, if the doors are locked, they'll be ripped from their hinges. They'll be sledgehammered. They'll be torn out. People will be in this place shoulder to shoulder, and you won't be able to hear yourself speak over the screams and the cries and the dread of people who realized, I didn't pay attention. They told me to get right with God, but I didn't. They said that I needed to quit living together in sin and get married, but I kept putting it off and making excuses. And they told me that I needed to get rid of sin or sin would get rid of me but I kept making excuses for my sin and my carnality and my sexual problems and my alcoholism and my hatred and my violence and my abuse I kept making excuses and thinking God's grace would cover it all but the rapture took place and I've been left behind churches all over this nation you'll be able to hear them from miles away, the cries and the screams of those who have been left behind and they heard the gospel but never made a commitment to Christ. The rapture refers to the sudden catching up of the church or believers here on earth to meet the Lord in the air. Let me give you another piece of Bible prophecy gold. The next major prophetic event on the calendar of God is the rapture of the church. That question comes to me quite often. What's the next prophecy that's going to take place? The next major prophecy that's going to be fulfilled next in line is the rapture of the church. The Bible tells me that there are three main passages on the rapture. And so I want you to write these down. Because these are the three main passages in the Bible that speak of the rapture. And by the way, I oftentimes refer to the rapture as the real separation of church and state. <laughs> the first main passage in the New Testament that addresses the rapture is John 14 verses 1 through 3. There the Bible says, don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God and trust also in me. There is more than enough room in my father's home. If this were not so, would I have told you that I am going to prepare a place for you? When everything is ready, I will come and get you so that you will always be with me where I am. That was Jesus addressing what we call the rapture of the church. Now, hold steady because I'm going to explain to you in a moment how we got the word rapture because the word rapture is not in your Bible. 
Many times through the years when I've preached on uh, eschatology and Bible prophecy or the rapture, not long ago, I had a man come to me after a service and say, can I speak to you privately? And uh, I could tell by the look in his eyes that he was ticked. And uh, so I was gracious. I said, yeah, sure. So he, he said, uh, you know, I'm, I'm just going to have to say it. You're a heretic. I said, I am. Yep, you're a heretic. I said, well, what would make you say that? Well, you preached on the rapture of the church. And he held his Bible out and he said, show me one place in my Bible where the word rapture can be found. You won't be able to find it. I took his Bible and I said, you're right. And I handed it back to him. I said, show me one place in your Bible where you can find the word Bible. <laughs> the word Bible's not in the Bible. It's always fun to watch the light go on in an empty lighthouse. <laughs> but that's true. The word Bible is not in your Bible. So in a moment, you're going to learn how we got the word rapture. It's just a theological term. We'll come back to that. The second main passage on the rapture in the New Testament is 1 Corinthians 15. Verses 50 through 57, there the Bible says, What I am saying, dear brothers and sisters, by the way, this is Paul's first letter to the church at Corinth. The apostle Paul wrote these words. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 50 through 57. What I am saying, dear brothers and sisters, is that our physical bodies cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Did you get that? Your physical body was not created for the kingdom of God. It was created for this earth and its gravity. Paul's teaching them. He said, your physical body cannot inherit the kingdom of God. These dying bodies cannot inherit what will last forever. This body was not intended to last forever. There are various periods of time assigned in the Bible to your physicality. In the Psalms, it says that it was appointed three score in ten. That's 70 years. If by God's reason and his grace, another 1080, if you've lived past 80, you're a blessed person. That's proof of the favor and the grace of God. But the bottom line is we're not going to live forever. This physical body is not meant for eternity. It is not meant for the kingdom of God. It was created for this earth. But you have a soul. Just as the Trinity is God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost, we were created in his image, Genesis 1, 27, and we have a triune nature, mind, body, and spirit. And your spirit is going to live forever in a new heavenly body. If you're married, turn to your wife and say, baby, there's a heavenly body coming. That wasn't very spiritual, was it? <laughs> These dying bodies cannot inherit what will last forever, verse 51, but let me reveal to you a wonderful secret. We will not all die, but we will all be transformed. There will be believers who are physically alive when the rapture takes place. Verse 52, it will happen in a moment. In the Greek, that's atomos, where we get the word atom small amount of time. I read years ago in my research that a group of scientists at General Electric calculated the twinkling of an eye at one twelve thousandths of a second. I calculated there was a group of scientists with way too much free time on their hands. <laughs> it will happen in a moment in the blink of an eye. By the way, uh, Paul wrote that because the blink of the eye is the quickest human movement. There is no movement in your body quicker than the blink of an eye. It was not literally saying one twelve thousandths of a second. It was talking about atomos in the Greek. Quick. Let me make it very practical for you. When the rapture takes place, there won't be enough time to pray. There won't be enough time to repent of sin. There'll not be enough time to make up for your shacking up. There'll not be enough time 
to get to church. There'll not be enough time to speed dial your favorite preacher, and any preacher that answers the phone wouldn't be worth talking to anyway. For when the trumpet sounds, those who have died will be raised to live forever, and we who are living will also be transformed. For our dying bodies must be transformed into bodies that will never die. Our mortal bodies must be transformed into immortal bodies. Then when our dying bodies have been transformed into bodies that will never die, the scripture will be fulfilled. Death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? For sin is the sting that results in death, and the law gives sin its power. But thank God he gives us victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus Christ. In a handful of days, in this very sanctuary, there is going to be a sad funeral. A 20-year-old boy whose life was cut short, and he's gone. But by God's grace and by God's mercy, that young man found Christ and gave his life to the Lord Jesus Christ. And I don't know if his parents are here or watching online or there's relatives here or watching online, but I want to give some encouragement not only to that family, but to those of you who have lost loved ones. Because that 20-year-old repented of sin and received Jesus Christ, he's as alive right now as he ever will be. To be absent from his body was to be present with Christ and every member of that family should purpose in their heart you're going to live for Jesus because there's a family reunion in heaven waiting one day and he'll welcome you there by the grace of God hey hallelujah and the third passage is 1 Thessalonians 4 verses 13 through 18 which I read as our text the weight of biblical scholarship rests upon a teaching that the second coming of Jesus Christ is going to take place in two phases. Those who oftentimes debate the rapture will accuse those of us who preach the rapture of saying, you believe in two second comings, which is an accusation that's not true. The Bible teaches the second coming of Jesus Christ in two phases. And the rapture is phase one. Let me give you a visual that you'll forever remember. That will help you to understand that. Because this is something that many seasoned Christians get confused. They don't know the difference between the rapture and the second coming. They don't know the proper timing of the rapture and the second coming. As you're going to learn not only tonight, but don't miss tomorrow night as we move from the rapture to the next major prophetic event, which is the great tribulation. The rapture and the second coming are like bookends. If I were to take you into my corporate office, not my office at my home, but my ministry office, you would see books everywhere. I just bought two more shelves to to keep all my books. I'm forever reading and studying. I owe that to you. I was called into the ministry. I don't take that lightly. I owe it to my audiences to be well read, well studied, well prepared, and knowledgeable about what I'm preaching. And I don't know it all. I'm learning every day. But I respect you. I respect your time. I respect your mind. I respect your pastor. I respect this house. You will never hear me preach that I haven't spent multiple hours and lifetime of studying the subject that I'm speaking. I'll never give you something frivolous. The weight of scholarship shows us this. If we walked into the office right behind my seat at my desk are some of the Bibles that I use the most frequently to study in various translations. But on either end of all of those Bibles are two book weights. Now, I happen to be a fly fisherman. I I love fly fishing. 
I built my own rods, tie my own flies. There's just something about that. Jesus said, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. Fishing is a great way to keep focused on souls. That's what I keep telling myself. <laughs> and those bookends are brass fly reels that are very heavy. And one's on the right side of the books and one's on the left side of the books and they keep the books in order and they keep them from falling over. The rapture is the left bookend. The second coming is the right bookend. And in between is a seven-year period of time called the Great Tribulation. If you're taking notes, write this down. The rapture is Christ coming for the church. The second coming is Christ coming with the church. When the rapture takes place, we shall be taken in the twinkling of an eye to meet the Lord in clouds of glory, to be with him forever and forever. It's Christ taking us with him. But in the second coming, we're coming back as the righteous army of God to rule and to reign. And we're coming back with Christ in the second coming. If you're still with me, say a vigorous amen. amen. The rapture is Christ coming for the church. The second coming is Christ coming with the church and they are the prophetic bookends on either side of the seven year window of time called the great tribulation and I'll cover it in greater detail tomorrow night but the weight of biblical scholarship rests upon first him coming for believers and then him coming with believers one of the things that I want to help you with is why isn't the word rapture found in the Bible? Because that is a stickler for a lot of people, and I don't have any issue with it. I actually uh, appreciate people asking me that because that lets me know they're studying their Bible carefully. You should never believe everything you hear just because a preacher holds a Bible in his head. You should always make sure that what he's preaching is in the Bible. That's why every night when you hear me preach, we go through multiple passages of Scripture. Over and over and over. If you've noticed my style, I'll read the Bible and then I'll carefully explain the passage. Once I've explained the passage, oftentimes quoting other passages to back it up, we go back into the Bible and we just keep peeling the Scriptures. Because you need to be built upon the foundation of God's word. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. I was in a large church in Texas not long ago, and uh, there was a visiting pastor there. He had heard me for the first time. He said, I've heard you online, and he said, you always say start in the Bible, stay in the Bible, and finish in the Bible. He said, tonight you preached 47 minutes. I thought, uh-oh, an anal preacher. I said, that's, that's good, I guess. He said, no, I, I couldn't believe it went so quick. I, I enjoyed it. I'm not, I'm not saying it was too long. He said, do you know how many verses of the Bible you either read or quoted in those 47 minutes? I said, no, I don't. I could pull my notes out and, and show you that it just is one verse after another. He said, I counted them. Because I wanted to see whether you just say it or you really do start in the Bible, stay in the Bible, and finish in the Bible. He said you went through 58 verses of the Bible in 50, 47 minutes. Well, the Bible will never fail you. Be careful when you listen to a preacher and he reads a single text when he starts and gives you 45 minutes of his commentary. There's a lot of room for trouble with people who think more about their commentary than they do the eternal word of the living God. If you believe that and receive that, say amen. amen. Now I'm going to have to take a few moments to bring people up to speed because there are many people that are listening that are brand new Christians. For some of you, you already know this, but it'll be good dress rehearsal anyway. The word Trinity isn't in the Bible. 
The word Bible isn't in the Bible. The word rapture isn't in the Bible. So let me just give you a little history lesson, and this is history from the Bible. A very notable scholar, if you're taking notes, his name was Jerome. Cool name for an old scholar. I, I call him J-Man, but his name was Jerome. 400 A.D., he translated the New Testament. He was the first scholar that translated the New Testament from the Greek manuscripts into the Latin language. All you need to know is Jerome, scholar, A.D. 400, first scholar to translate the New Testament from the Greek manuscript to Latin. The term rapture is from a Latin word when he translated caught up. I mean, what we have in the English caught up. But from the Latin, it's rapio. Which is where the root of the word rapture comes from. Now, whether you remember all of this trivia or not has nothing to do with your salvation. But if somebody ever asks you how come the word rapture isn't in the Bible, I think you probably ought to be able to explain that since it's such a fundamental part of Bible prophecy. Jerome, scholar, 400 A.D., first scholar to translate the New Testament from the Greek manuscripts to Latin. That passage that I read to you in 1 Thessalonians 4, where in the English the Bible says we're going to be caught up. In the Latin, it's rapio, which means caught up or caught away. This Latin word in the equivalent from the Greek is harpazio. Don't care if you remember that from the Greek. But it means caught up or caught away. Or snatched up. So if the word rapture really offends you. <laughs> that's what I told that, that gentleman that called me a heretic. I said if the word rapture really offends you. When I handed him his Bible back and he had that cross-eyed look. When I said the word Bible's not in your Bible either. But when I handed him his Bible back. I said listen brother. If the word rapture seriously offends you. Just call it the great catching up. Or call it. The great snatching away. But you need to calm down. <laughs> because the word rapture is just a word that defines the event. So with that said, now you know where the word rapture comes from. We could spend some more time on that. It's not necessary. One more question and I close. What are the signs of the rapture? Because this is asked of me all of the time. What prophecies point to the rapture? Uh, will, will you take my Bible and, and, and help me highlight some of the things? Sh show me in the Bible and prophecy the signs that point to the rapture. Are you ready for this if you're taking notes? The rapture is a signless event. The rapture is a signless event. God put no specific signs that point to the rapture. Now, I'm going to be brief on this as we come to a conclusion, but don't miss tomorrow night. As you've already said, and I promised you, and I'm keeping my promise, when God put this meeting together, I felt this series of messages, and by the way, I, I don't do this. Rarely do I do this. This is the first time in probably more than a year, maybe two, that I've been to a church where I felt like what was going on in the world required me to keep my entire attention on prophecy and walk people through a systematic, chronological understanding of the fundamentals of end time prophecy. But people really seem to get help from this and courage from this and clarity from this, and I hope you will too. So tomorrow night, I'm going to spend more time on this subject of the Great Tribulation. Quite thoroughly, actually. And you're going to receive a lot of encouragement and help from that, especially when I prove to you from the Bible that the church can't go through the tribulation. Because some of you have read books by people who have said the church is going through the tribulation or part of the tribulation or halfway through the tribulation. Tomorrow night, I am going to show you five biblical reasons that are irrefutable as to why the church can't go through the tribulation. And by the way, in my life notes, I have 50 
biblical reasons why the church cannot go through the great tribulation, turn to your neighbor and say, I'm glad he's only going to do five. Back to the question, what are the signs of the rapture? If you're taking notes, don't forget to write that down. In eschatology, the rapture is a signless event. Matthew chapter 24 and verse 36, back to the Bible again. We don't leave it much, do we? Matthew 24, 36, no man knows the day nor the hour that the Son of Man will appear, no, not the angels in heaven, but my Father only. Jesus said, only the Father knows the time of the rapture. The devil doesn't know it. Demons don't know it. Governments don't know it. The Senate doesn't know it. The House of Representatives do not know it. The Supreme Court doesn't know it. No world luminary, no world revolutionary. No man knows the day nor the hour. But we have other things in prophecy that we know exactly. For example, as you're going to learn tomorrow night, we know the exact moment that the great tribulation begins. The exact moment. The Bible tells us in Daniel chapter 9 that the moment that the Antichrist in Jerusalem signs the peace treaty with Israel for a seven-year trial period of peace in the Middle East, that's the exact day that the great tribulation begins. And then it will be exactly seven years to the day. Not by our calendar, but by the Jewish calendar of 360 days. So the great tribulation, we know the exact moment that it starts. Therefore, those that are left behind, if they know what I'm teaching or they've been students of eschatology and they've dug a little and done their research, they'll know the exact day of the second coming of Christ. So all of the signs in the Bible that are specific, all of the prophecies in the Bible that are specific, they're not pointing to the rapture, for the rapture is a signless event. I'll come back to this tomorrow night in great detail that I think will be a blessing to you, but all of those prophecies are pointing to what's going to happen after the rapture. They point to things in the great tribulation. They point to things in the first half of the tribulation. They point to the middle day of the tribulation. They point to the last three and a half years of the tribulation. They point to the second coming of Christ at the end of the tribulation. They point to the millennial reign. They point to the eternal kingdom. They point to the new heaven and the new earth where everyone is right with God. But they don't point to the rapture. It's going to come in an hour that you think not. And so you've got to live ready every day. Amen. Matthew 24 verse 37. When the Son of Man returns, it'll be like it was in Noah's day. In those days before the flood, the people were enjoying banquets and parties and weddings right up to the time Noah entered his boat. People didn't realize, don't miss this, People didn't realize what was going to happen until the flood came and swept them all away. That is the way it will be when the Son of Man comes. Two men will be working together in the field. One will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding flour at the mill. One will be taken. The other left. So you too must keep watch. For you don't know what day your Lord is coming. Understand this. If a homeowner knew exactly when a burglar was coming, he would keep watch and not permit his house to be broken into. You also must be ready all the time for the Son of Man will come when least expected. Do you realize that prophetically the rapture could take place tonight? I'm going to be very honest with you. I've preached prophecy my entire ministry. I've always loved Bible prophecy. By the way, I want to honor your pastor. 
Because many churches never bring anybody in to preach or to teach on Bible prophecy, and they do the church and the body of Christ in injustice. Prophecy is not an easy subject because there are so many different views that it requires you to do extensive study and research. And pastors like your pastors here that take the time to bring in a guest who will focus on Bible prophecy, do you realize that that releases a blessing in the church? Open your Bible to Revelation chapter 1. Revelation, by the way, is the last book in the Bible, if you're a new Christian. But I want to show you why you're going to be blessed tonight. Revelation chapter 1, go down to verse 3. God blesses the one who reads the words of this prophecy to the church. That's me. I know for an absolute fact that one of the reasons why God blesses me and God has blessed Lost Lamb has nothing to do with me, has nothing to do with my abilities. My abilities are mediocre at best. But one of the reasons why God has shown such favor to Lost Lamb and to this ministry is because for 40 years, I poured my life into studying Bible prophecy. Several nights before I was here, I was up till three in the morning. Two out of seven days, I was up till five and 5.30 in the morning. Studying, reading, researching, crawled in bed, set the alarm for 6.30, got up and started another day. Because the Bible is that valuable to me. And as I'm seeing the things that are happening in our world today, the weight of responsibility of knowing how close we are to the rapture gives me such an intense passion to share with you what I'm sharing and to help people to understand these fundamentals. I want you to be ready. I'm not here to try to impress anybody. I'm not here to try to say, look what I've learned. I'm here to tell you Jesus is coming. The rapture is next. You need to get ready. You need to live holy. You need to repent of sin. There's no person worth going to hell over. There's no relationship worth going to hell over. There's no man worth going to hell over. There's no woman worth going to hell over. There's no drug worth going to hell over. There's nothing in a bottle worth going to hell over. There's no pleasure worth going to hell over. The rapture is about to take place and the children of the Most High God must live holy and ready. If you believe it and receive it, give the Lord a mighty hand of praise. God blesses the one who reads the words of the prophecy to the church, and he blesses all who listen to its message. That's you. He blesses all who listen to the message of prophecy and obey what it says, for the time is near. The book of Revelation is the only book in the Bible of all 66 books incentivized by a promised blessing. Of all 66 books, it's the only book incentivized by a guaranteed blessing from God. Because God knew that if people in the church would keep prophecy in the forefront of their focus as to how we live, why we live, why we do what we do, why we sow, why we sacrifice, why we do what we do for the kingdom of God. It's not for something that doesn't count. It's for something of eternal significance, and it's worth it. You've never heard me say it's easy to be a Christian. I've never in 41 years of preaching told anybody it's easy to be a Christian. It's easier to be a sinner. It's easier to follow the 
crowd. It's easier to yield to peer pressure. It takes strength to stand up for God. It takes holy boldness to square your shoulders and like Joshua of old, say, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. But though it is not easy to be a Christian, it is always worth it to be a Christian. It is always powerful to know when you lay your head to the pillow, if the Lord comes tonight, I'm ready to go. And pardon me if that makes me passionate, but I'm talking about eternity, and I'm talking about your eternity, and your family, and your children, and your grandchildren. You will be so glad that you lived ready to meet the Lord. If you believe it and receive it, give the Lord a mighty hand of praise. I'd like for everyone to stand to your feet, if you would, please. There is not one single prophecy in the Bible that needs to be fulfilled before the rapture of the church. The Lord could come today. Many Bible scholars, and I'll not take the time to peel that onion, but many Bible scholars believe that in the 80s, the decade of the 80s was the first time in all of human history, in the church age, that people could say, the rapture is free to take place at any given moment. I don't worry about that. Because I learned a long time ago that it's signless. The rapture is a signless event. Be ye also ready. What was the only verse in the Bible I said to memorize? If the only verse you memorize on Bible prophecy, it's Matthew 24, 44. Be ye also ready. For in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. Now we're going to do the most important thing that we've done all night. I want to give you an opportunity to settle the score. I want to give you an opportunity to be sure that your heart is right with Christ. Because some of you, if you'd be honest, listen, I love you. I really do. I love you. Say, you've never met me. You were made in the image of God, and God loves you. And God is my Father, so I love you too. By faith, I love you. I learned a long time ago what I told you out of Colossians chapter 2. Make allowance for one another's faults. People have imperfections. I'm imperfect. You're imperfect. But we're called to strive to be like Christ. But how many of you know that that's a work in progress? Do you remember what I told you? The only thing you have to be sure of to be ready for the rapture? Be in Christ. He's coming for those who are in Christ. What does it mean to be in Christ? I explained it before. Let me cover it one more time. There has to be a time in your life when A, you admit your sin. B, you have to believe in Jesus Christ. C, you have to commit your heart to him by faith. The ABCs of getting right with God. Getting right with God is as simple as ABC. Admit your sin. Believe in Christ. Commit your heart to him by faith. And God made it so that from the youngest child to the most older, older and elderly individual in the house, all come the same way, in humility, in faith, and in courage. When we pray together, I'm not going to keep you. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to make a spectacle out of you. I'm not asking you tonight to join a church, although I believe that if you grow in Christ, eventually you should find a good Bible-believing church with a godly pastor, and you should attach yourself to it. It's important. It's God's holy church. I said it before, and I'll say it again. If I lived anywhere near this area, I've been coming to this church for almost 40 years. This would be my home church. Pastor Terry would be my pastor. 
And I could have him as my pastor and Becky as my pastor's wife with joy of heart. They're real people. They came from wonderful, godly parents. Their children rise up and call them blessed. This is a special place. And if you don't have a home church, I hope you'll get rooted and plugged in here. Going to church is kind of like, how many have ever gone to a bonfire? I, I, I love a fire. There's a saying, white man builds a big fire and sits far away. Indian builds small fire and sits close. I just built my wife a porch. She wanted one her whole life. And uh, I actually had the stone brought in from Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania Fieldstone, because she was born in Pennsylvania. And I just wanted to do something special for her at this stage of life. But I have a little fire pit out there. And I love to go out there in the evenings when I'm home and sit by a fire. But you know what happens with a fire? No matter how good the fire is, if you take one of the logs or one of the pieces of kindling away from the fire, it goes out. Put it back in the fire, lights right back up. That's why the church is so important. God never intended you to be an island under yourself. And when people quit the church and when people get away from the house of God, the fire goes out. Because God never intended for you to be solitary. He intended for you to be a part of the warm, beautiful, imperfect family of God. And though we may have some different shapes and sizes like all wood does, we can all burn together and stay warm under the coming of the Lord, safe and ready in God's precious house. But some of you that are listening to me, if you'd be honest... Don't miss this. You're religious, but you're not right with God. I love you, but I'm a straight shooter. And I've been at this for so long, and I see it all the time. It's a very common, common problem. People, if they're not careful, they slip into religiosity. They go to church. They even know their worship songs. They'll even raise a hand when they sing. They'll tithe. They'll try to be decent and moral. But they stop living a holy life. And they stop reading their Bible every day. And they stop praying every day. And they stop praying for unsaved souls and unsaved family. And they stop being faithful to the house of God. Did you know that that was prophesied in the Bible? I'm going to come to that tomorrow night. But the Bible says in the last days, there'll be a great falling away from faith. And there will be people who will stand before the Lord who said, Lord, look at all of this ministry stuff we did in your name. Cast out devils, heal the sick, proclaim the gospel. And the Bible says, depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. I never knew you. Well, what was the difference? They slipped from right relationship with God to religiosity. You can go to church every Sunday of your life and die and go to hell. You need to live holy. And you need to live in victory over sin. And some of you need to pray with me because the truth be known, you're not living in victory over sin. Sin is living in victory over you. And somehow you've slipped, and I'm not condemning you, I'm here to help you. You've allowed yourself to slip into a place where you continue with all of the religious stuff, but you still have this other life that violates everything the covenant of salvation is supposed to be. And if the rapture were to take place tonight, you'd be left behind, and you'd be surprised. You'd be like those people that said, Lord, but Lord... But he said, I never knew you. I never knew you. It's about right relationship with the Lord. Some of you that will pray with me, this will be the first time you've ever made your own personal public commitment. 
But there are others of you that are backslidden away from the Lord, and the Holy Spirit's been speaking to you that you've been slipping. And it's very subtle. Backsliding is very subtle. Backsliding's not a blowout. How many have ever had a tire blowout? It's like a gun going off. I mean, it'll, it'll lift you right out of the seat. Backsliding's never a blowout. Backsliding is always the toleration of a slow leak. And some of you got a slow leak going on and you need to come home. This preacher loves you. The Lord loves you. The rapture's about to take place and you need to come home. So here's what we're going to do. They're going to sing a song of invitation. And as they do, I'm going to kneel and I'm going to pray that God will give you the courage to do what you ought to do. I want those of you that have the courage, the Lord speaking to you, tonight's your night to make it right. But I always ask those that have the courage, you be the very first ones to come. Your courage will help somebody that doesn't have the same courage you do. Christian, here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I've asked you to do it every service. I'll ask you to do it tomorrow night. I'll ask you to do it Wednesday night. As people are being drawn by the Spirit to repent of sin and to receive Jesus Christ, you as a Christian, be very sensitive to the people that are sitting around. Maybe you invited someone. Maybe there's a new person here at the church. Maybe a first-time visitor. But if there's somebody near you and you're not sure that they've ever made their own public and personal decision for Jesus Christ, just turn to them and say this. Are you ready? Listen. Just turn to them and say, if you'd like to pray that prayer, I'll walk with you. We've already seen several people in these meetings give their hearts to Christ because a friend turned to them and then walk to this altar with them. Now listen, if you kneel, that's great. But if it's difficult for you to kneel, you can stand. People have knee surgery, hip replacements. We had some 96, 94 and 96 year olds that got saved recently in Lost Lamb Crusades. They needed help to walk to the altar. It, it was like difficult. The one lady that was 96 turned to her daughter and said, I need to go forward, but I need you to help me. She was weak, 96 years old. When she got to the front, I saw that she was feeble. I turned to one of the altar workers and whispered, tell that precious lady to just have a seat. And if you're elderly or you just had a, a knee surgery, or your wife kicked you in the shin after supper and you limping. Just find a seat. It's not so much the posture of your body, it's the posture of your heart. And we're going to pray together. A lot of people call it a sinner's prayer. I'm okay with that. We're going to make it right with God. And if you felt the Lord tugging on your heart, now's your time. You start coming as they sing and then we'll pray together. Sing it again. God's speaking to your heart. Come on. Tonight's your night. We're going to take time to pray. If you've not come to this altar and you need to be here, 
come now. We're going to pray. If you've not turned to that one next to you, if you're not sure, you can turn to them and say, I'll walk with you. But we're going to pray. Listen, the Bible says, all who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's such a wonderful, wonderful promise. All who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I love when the Bible is exclusive. He'll never turn you away. The Bible says all who confess their sins shall receive mercy. So when we pray right now, you're literally talking to God. And he said he literally hears your prayer. All who call upon my name, he hears that prayer. Pray this with me out loud at the altar. Dear Heavenly Father, tonight as I was listening to the Bible, you were speaking to me. In Bible prophecy, you spoke to us. You warned us. And tonight I choose. I want to live ready to meet the Lord. I admit my sin. You know everything I've ever done. But tonight I repent. In childlike faith, I turn my back on sin and I turn my heart to Jesus. Tonight I make my commitment. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Be my Savior. I receive salvation as the gift of God and not by my own works. But because of the cross and the blood that you shed, wash me tonight. Cleanse my mind, my body, and my spirit. And make me holy in your eyes. I vow this night, I will serve the Lord all the days of my life. In place of my weakness, give me your strength. Fill me with the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, I'll never be the same. Tonight I'm saved. I'm delivered, and I'm healed, and I thank you in Jesus' name, amen, and amen. Give the Lord a mighty hand of praise.